Now, um, Lindy Rich was very kind to, uh, I approached her and asked if she would do this talk and she was very kind to agree to because she'd only just been appointed um, uh, to the East Devon AONB. Um, she um, is the wildlife um, officer and previously had worked in nature conservation in the Southwest uh, and, and in South Wales and had worked um, in wildlife trusts in different counties and the Woodland Trust. And I would now like to hand over to her and thank you again very much, Linda, for agreeing to do this talk. Thank you. Hello, everybody, and thank you for coming along today. Um, I'd like to uh, do my, the talk. It's going to be about local nature recovery action. I'm going to talk a little bit to so start with three slides just about the AOMB for anyone who's uh, not got that much knowledge about the AOMB. And then I'll, I'll go on to look at groups of animals, starting with bats and then butterflies uh, and, and then farmland birds. And we'll look at, and through that, I'm going to talk about some things that everybody can do to help the rare species that we have and some of the commoner ones as well in those groups. And I'll finish off with some useful online resources that you can access as well to help you in, in your efforts to support nature recovery. So as you, as you are now aware, I work for the East Devon AOMB. And with native species and habitats in decline like never before, AOMB partnerships have made a formal commitment of their own to increase the scale and pace of nature delivery for nature in the form of the Colchester Jack Declaration. This includes three key pledges, a nature recovery plan, a species action plans, and to improve nature connectedness. And this diagram actually um, describes in a sort of uh, in a visual form, how our work is, is to be focused within the OMB. Um, and we've got three overlapping circles, the nature recovery plan, the species action plans, and the and engagement through events. And they all come together in the middle to form more connected communities and landscapes. So there's a sort of central aim of connecting people back to nature as part of that. And then just a quick diagram for anyone who doesn't know the boundaries of the AOMB. Um, the yellow is the East Devon AOMB. Um, it stretches from Exmouth up to Uplime and as far north as the south side of Honiton here. And then we've also got in East Devon another AOMB, the Black Downs Hills AOMB in the green up here. And they, they are next side by side, this section near Honiton. So actually quite a, quite a large proportion of East Devon, AOM, East Devon uh, is, is actually AOMB, so it's probably a good thing for the, the area. Right, now I'm going to go on to bats. I suppose, I'm, I'm sure you're all aware of, the, of the, uh, the interest in the area for the Jurassic Coast and its many fossils, a landscape 250 million years in the making. But there's another secret yet to be widely known. The East Devon area is still home to some very ancient species which are still alive today. And of course, in this case, it's we're talking about rat, bats. When did bats first appear in the fossil record? They pop up around 55 million years ago during a time known as the Eocene. Paleontologists have recorded remains ranging from teeth and bits of jaw to stunning full skeletons across the world from Wyoming, Paris, China, Australia, and India. It's a bit of an evolutionary mystery where bats came from and how they evolved to become so specialized. You see a very excellent bat skeleton there from the US of A. Um, but as, as there were bats in Paris, there's no reason to think they weren't in South, in East Devon as well at that early time. So today, the bats haven't changed a huge amount, a little bit of evolution since then, but uh, this is one of our rarest bats, 
the greater horseshoe bat. It's also one of our largest bats, about the size of a small pear. In today's landscape, it typically roosts in old rural buildings, although originally it would have been roosting in, uh, in trees and, and in, in, in the winter periods and autumn and spring, it, it would spend time in caves. And another rare bat that we have here is the best Stein's bat. This elusive tree lover hunts, mates and lives in woodland, relying on old trees for roosting sites. Loss of habitat means this once common species is now one of our rarer bats. And in fact, it's one of our less studied bats as well. The woodland, the woodland bats uh, have lost out a little bit in, in, in research and um, studies in recent years. And we're, we're only just now trying to catch up. We have the rare Barbastel and the rare Bastines, which are both woodland bats. And current research is starting to focus on them a bit more because up till now, we didn't know much about them. And we're still learning about their habits and their use of trees as roosts. Um, so radio tracking has been going on in recent years, including in East Devon, to try and work out where the best time back is, bat is going. It's actually, it actually spends time in beer caves and the radio tracking has tracked it to farmland trees to the north of there. Um, and yeah, we still don't fully understand their choices of movement or the, the types. We certainly don't know where all their tree roots are yet. So there's still a long way to go with that. So the gray long-eared bat, that's probably the rarest bat in East Devon. Um, as you can see, it's got very long ears, nearly as long as its body. It's only about, they reckon about, sorry, I moved on one too fast. Uh, only about a thousand in the UK. So some, there's also been some work being, going on with that species and I'll tell you about that in a minute. So this is a map, this is a UK map showing the distribution of sites where the great grey long-eared bat has been uh, found. So the red stars here are our maternity colonies and two of the surviving maternity roosts are in East Devon and these form an important link between colonies in Dorset and South Devon and altogether there are only eight maternity roosts uh, that is breeding roosts, uh, known to be located in southern England. It's key really for this species that uh, good linkages are available to allow the bats to commute across the countryside. Mature tree lines and hedgerows are vital. Managing grassland in a wildlife friendly way to boost invertebrate prey populations is also a key requirement for their survival. So, Talking about recent project work, we had a special uh, project called Return of the Night Rider. And together with Bat the Bat Conservation Trust, we made a successful bid to the government's Green Recovery Challenge Fund for £69,000 to support our collaborative Return of the True Night Rider project. The funding, the fu the funding work has been completed with targets met, including management of key grasslands near the roosts, engagement with local people and supporting the development of our volunteer base who can then go on to help monitor the roosts and continue to work with landowners to manage grasslands in a way which will maximize invertebrate prey. What's key with all these species of bat? are the connectivity of our landscape. And if you look at this image, you can see the network of hedgerows linking up with woodlands, which are critical for these rare species, and probably why East Devon is one of the best places in the UK for bats, along with the rest of Devon, I guess, because the whole of Devon is, good, is relatively good for bats and has a significant number of the rare species. They, they also rely on uh, traditional farm management which unfortunately obviously has decreased as we move into modern farming methods. Um, grazed 
grazed meadows and hay meadows, uh, hay meadow management were very important and the, the move away from hay meadow management has disadvantaged these rare species. Also, the use of uh, chemicals in, in livestock farming um, to control worm issues within the animals um, then, then causes problems when it goes into their dung and then kills invertebrates in the dung, which are then sort of become lost to the rare bats. So there are a whole range of farming issues which have led to the decline of their insect prey. This, this landscape that we're lucky to have uh, also supports other rare species, which depend on the woodlands and connectivity provided by trees and hedgerows across the landscape. So just to finish off we're on the bats side of things, uh, I've put together a few ideas of how you, well, anyone can help bats. One of, the, one of the ways we can help bats, which is often not talked about in this sort of sense, is external lighting, because the rare bats and some of the commoner bats, in fact, are quite a light sensitive and need dark corridors linking their feeding and roosting sites. So all of us in, in the villages around the A&B can try to minimize our external lighting and, make, and ensure when we change our lighting, that we change it for something that's bat, relatively bat friendly. And this will allow the bats to use the corridors through your villages and potentially through towns as well um, to, to seek uh, food. And if, if there's too much lighting, the bats will avoid those routes and that will then limit their access to, to fields and other, other resources further afield. So what you can do is avoid external lighting that causes excessive light spill particularly things like flood lighting. Avoid, avoid light spill onto hedgerows and tree lines because those are the places where the bats will be traveling through to resources, food resources further away. Use PIR movement activated lights where possible to ensure outside lights are not on for long periods. Use warm white LED bulbs, which have less impact on bats. And down lighters are better than, much better than up lighters. So we've got a down lighter here, we've got the warm white bulb. And down here obviously is the thing you don't want. You don't want bright all round lights shining directly on a hedgerow or a tree line. So the bottom I've given um, a link to uh, the Bat Conservation Trust website, which provides more guided guidance on lighting which can be given to an uh, electrician if you're having changes done to your lighting. So that's a useful link for you. Um, more ways to help rare bats. Um, obviously wildlife gardening can help these rare bats because when they're traveling through, the more insects they can find along the route, the better. And if those, if those insects are in your garden, that's fine, they don't mind. They won't only be looking at farmland. And so if your garden is offering a good insect prey, it will, and it's not too, hasn't got too much lighting, then they will pass through and take advantage of the insects that are in your garden. So obviously, as many gardeners will know, these are sorts of things you can do. Really, it's things that will help pollinators, because if you're helping pollinators and, and insects in general, you will be supporting the bats. So grow plants that support pollinators. Creating a pond is always valuable for bats because obviously you get a higher number of insects um, around the, in the pond side environments and the bats do like flying around ponds. So yeah, if you can manage to create a pond, that's great. Retrain, retain trees and hedgerows. Again, we all, we've talked about connectivity. Um, manage hedgerows with a lighter touch to allow some flowering and fruiting. And this, this is something which probably needs to be done much more in our landscape where a lot of hedges are trimmed quite often. 
and this, this often removes flowers and fruits before the cycle has been completed. Um, many insects rely on hedgerows, on the pollen sources of the flowers, and to some extent the fruit as well. So if, if you can all manage your hedgerows a bit, a bit less uh, with a light attach, that would be a huge benefit. So also obviously the obvious one, sowing native wildflower seed. Um, the wildflowers are often important sources of nectar for all the uh, insects. And you know, if you really want to go all the way uh, with this, create a hay meadow effect on your lawn by leaving it uncut or part of it uncut from May to June, July. And that, that's tremendously benefit from vertebrates. So some more things to do with, uh, if you've got, you might have a roost. Have you seen bats in your loft or exiting from your tiles or your roof just after dusk? Well, if you have, you probably have a bat roost in your property. As you probably are aware, but hopefully, but bats are protected under the Wildlife and Countryside Act. They don't actually do damage in properties. They make use of existing crevices. Um, and of course, our, our buildings are providing a key habitat for them for their survival in the absence of a, not a sufficient old trees with hollows. They, have, they do make, all, all of the species make quite a lot of use of buildings. So if you think you've got a bat roost, it's worthwhile contacting your local bat group or the Bat Conservation Trust for advice regarding your roost. And if you plan to do work that might disturb them, also get in touch. And always a fun thing to do if you have a roost is to learn how to watch your bats exit their roost at dusk. And to do that, you need to avoid lighting and sit quietly, work out where the bats are coming out. <laughs> and after a few nights, you'll be able to count them out as they go off for, to forage at dusk. And it really can be quite fun. Uh, and children quite enjoy doing it as well. So if you want more information about bat roosts, again, we've got the link at the bottom to the Bat Conservation Trust website. Where there's a whole large raft of information about all the different aspects of having a roost in your house. I was very lucky recently, actually. And I had a very big surprise because I've recently moved into a house and then within a couple of months, I saw a bat in my loft. And I was, to be honest, I was quite surprised because I haven't had a bat roost before. <laughs> so yeah, I was quite chuffed, but uh, he, he, the little bat has gone on its way now, but it might be back in the summer. <laughs> so moving on to butterflies, again, we've got a fossil record in, in the, in the in the UK and abroad that uh, includes the early form, shall we say, of butterflies. So we've got another ancient fleet species that's still around. This, on the left here, we've got a, a, what's called a lacewing, although it looks very much like a butterfly. And it was fluttering around at the same time as the dinosaurs. And that was 165 million years ago. So when you look at the two, you realize that our butterflies are not that much different and 165 million years of time that they've been around on the, on the planet. And on the right hand side, we've got the small pearl bordered fritillary, an increasingly scarce butterfly, which occurs in East Devon and needs damp grassland habitats. So we'll now look at a few more species of butterfly that occur in East Devon and then look at how you can, how we've been helping them and how you can help them. So on the left, we've got uh, the brown hair streak butterfly, uh, needs uh, woodland and connectivity and hedgerows, and it has suffered a dramatic de decline in recent years. These rare butterflies also depend on the linkages that we were just talking about for the bats. They need exactly the same thing. Butterflies like sheltered to, to, to fly along he sheltered hedgerows when they move between habitats. Um, so that, that network of connectivity is just as important for the butterflies. 
And some of them, like the brown hair streak, lay their eggs on hedgerows. Um, it lays its eggs on blackthorn, and we'll be talking about that in a minute. So the port pearl bordered fritillary is, is become very rare in East Devon, but it does still occur on the pebble bed heaths, although the numbers are not, not great. So this coming year, we're hoping to have a reassessment of the population on the pebble bed heaths and see if there's anything we can do to help the very low population that, that's still existing there. So moving on to the a bit more detail on the brown hair streak, these two pictures show the top side of the wings and the underside of the wings. And it's quite different. You almost think it was different butterfly. But yeah, here's the top side of the wings, dark brown with a red orange splodge, and then the lower wings, um, a variety of orange with the white lines. And then this is the food plant for the brown, brown hair streak, uh, blackthorn, um, usually in hedgerows and shrubs because it likes to lay its eggs on the young growth of the, of the, of the blackthorn. We don't fully understand why they pick on the young growth, but they need like one to two year old growth um, to lay their little white, creamy white eggs here the little round, it's very beautiful actually, a bit like a like pollen sort of pattern on it. When you get your hand lens out, that is magnified there. It's only about, the eggs are only about one millimeter, well, less than one millimeter across, about half a millimeter. So you have to get your hand lens out to see the level of detail that you can on this picture. And um, some ongoing work that we have, some of you may well be aware of because some people have been working to survey the species using the searching for eggs in the Sid Vale. So this, this map shows the results from last year. Um, uh, we, we set up on uh, a survey method with survey forms, and it's all on our website, the East Devon A and B website. But you can still join in because it's still going on this year. Uh, this, this plan so shows the results from last year. And we had a lot of results from Colliford, Colliton, that sort of area, uh, which were positive. Unfortunately, we had quite a lot of negative results from the Sid Bale and the Sidmouth area. But I think I'm still hoping that we will actually find some records. I think they may just be very, very low numbers in, in the area of Devon, um, sort of north of Tipton St John. Uh, west of Tipton St John, that sort of area, I think they may still be there. So if anyone thinks they, they love searching for something and then for quite a lot of hours, <laughs> small tiny eggs in hedgerows, and then they would be persistent enough to keep going, um, do, do, do get in touch. My email address is at the end. Um, and have a look at our website. There's a full description of how to do the survey and also um, Saving Devon's Treescapes, another project, has, um, also has information on, on their website and they're compiling the results for this year. Um, so yeah, the, the Saving Devon's Treescapes is being led and coordinated by um, Devon Wildlife Trust. So you can go on their website and, and see their page. So uh, yeah, that's something to, if you want to join in with something, that's, that's ongoing. And moving on to the pearl bordered fritillary, the one I mentioned, which is very, very rare in East Devon, um, that we, we're planning to do some more survey work this year to try and establish exactly how many are, are on the pebble bed heaths um, towards Exmouth, that sort of area. And, um, and hopefully then we can assess if there's anything we can do to help the species increase its numbers it's one of the earliest butterflies to emerge. So if you're going to survey for the butterfly, you need to be around in April, which is very early for butterflies. And it could be that sometimes the records haven't been forthcoming because a lot of people who look for butterflies don't go out that early. It's one of the few that come that, that flies so early in the year. So early, early butterfly watching is probably 
the thing you need to do for this one. Again, like many of the other um, uh, butterflies, loss of habitat is contributing to its decline. It needs open glades in woodland um, where overwintering caterpillars feed on common dog violet. And unfortunately, quite a lot of woods haven't had quite enough management in recent years. The coppicing cycles have stopped and the, there are fewer open glades that support the violet populations that they need for laying their eggs on and which caterpillars then feed on. Again, you've got the top of the wings in the top picture and you've got the underwings in the bottom picture here. So quite an attractive butterfly to look out for when you're out in the countryside, particularly around the edges of I and mean, in woodland, in woodland glades. And the small pearl bordered fritillary looks very similar to the pearl bordered fritillary. It's a little bit smaller, as you might imagine. And again, they both have distinctive spots or pearls on the underside of their wings. But the small pearl bordered fritillary is more contrasted with, with, fewer ex, with a few extra spots, as well as being a little bit smaller. You see here these extra spots in the bottom picture. Its population is larger than the pearl bordered as it occurs in grassy, marshy places as well as woodland edges and glades. The caterpillars also require violets as their food plant. And this species also occur, occurs on the pebble bed heaths um, and a few areas along the coast um, on the habitats towards the top of the cliffs. It's some, sometimes quite a difficult place to survey them obviously because of the collapsing cliffs. Um, so, yeah, so it may be easier. We're planning to survey this one at the same time that we try and survey the pearl bordered um, this year, obviously with a slightly different um, time period in the summer. And see if we can make some progress with identifying any issues we've got on the pebble bed heaths as to why they're relatively uncommon. And the two violet species that they tend to rely on for their laying their eggs on and the caterpillars feeding on, the common dog violet and the heath dog violet. Uh, and how can you help butterflies? Well, it's a little bit similar to the bats really, which is something that you'll find throughout this talk. Because if you're gonna help bats, you need to help invertebrates. And if you're gonna help butterflies, they are an invertebrate, so you need to help them as, and twice over. But yeah, growing plants that provide nectar for butterflies. And here's, here's a selection of species that does that very well. All the sort of daisy family have easily accessible nectar for butterflies. Uh, there's knapweed, that's a native species there. But you can grow that as a garden plant as well. And then we've got scabious, which again have similar types of flowers, excellent for butterflies. Aster, verbena, and the last picture is, is really of a, an area of a, we'd like to encourage people to have a little wild corner of their garden um, with long grass and tall herbs, mainly because many butterfly caterpillars actually feed on, on grasses, but they can't survive on mown lawns or short grazed turf. So if you allow some grass to mingle with some tall herbs back of your garden, some of the commoner, okay, some of the commoner butterflies, but even some of the medium, less common butterflies, may well lay their eggs on the grass. Obviously, they don't want it all cut back too soon um, while the caterpillars are still feeding. And then you may well create your own little breeding area for the butterflies on the long grasses there. In hedgerows is also an issue for, for butterflies. If you can manage hedgerows with a lighter touch, with some sections uncut each year, to allow flowering and fruiting. This will support all insect life, including butterflies, and particularly the, uh, the brown hair streak that we were talking about earlier, which lays its eggs on blackthorn and is now relatively rare, uh, really needs the blackthorn to have young growth on, on the hedgerow. If it hasn't, the adult butterflies don't really like laying. Um, so if you can allow some growth to be left uncut each year, that really helps the brown hair streak and other rare butterflies. Sow native wildflower seeds in your border or lawn or create a hay meadow. So actually 
some of the same things that can help butterflies can also help bats. Just moving on to fossil plants in the fossil record. The oldest flowering plants found in the fossil record are considered to be 135 million years old. Here, this, is, this is the oldest fossil that they're aware of at the moment. Research now suggests that the first flowering plant probably existed more than 100 million years earlier, although geologists are still looking for fossils to fill the, the, the long geological time gap. It may be that the long period of geological time, for a long period of geological time, flowering plants were rare. And just, we're just going to touch on flowering plants because uh, I haven't got time to go into all them in detail, but here's two rare species that are special to Devon. The Heath lobelia is very special to East Devon because we have one of the few remaining populations. This is the Heath lobelia on the left and the Devon white bean, which is special to the whole of Devon. So the Heath lobelia, also known as the Kilmington lily, was first discovered growing in the UK at Kilmington in East Devon back in the 1760s. It's, it's, it flowers from late July until early September and requires acidic heathlands and disturbed ground, which helps seeds to germinate. It's extremely rare in the UK, only nine sites, five, and only in five counties from Cornwall to Sussex. You can see we're right in the middle of that stretch of, some of these dots on this map show old records where it no longer occurs. So it's only the darker red ones that show current populations. Um, we've been working with, on the Kilmington lily as part of our special species project work. In September, volunteers from our Heath lobelia group in Kil the Kilmington and Shute area cleared brambles and planted Heath lobelia plants at Kilmington. We're trying to increase the population because the population got desperately low and was in fact mainly in a residential property garden um, where it had survived all that time. But we're now been planting out on a heath area in Kilmington. And then moving on to the Devon white bean. The Devon white bean is endemic to Britain and grows wild in only four places, Devon, Cornwall, Somerset and Ireland. It can reproduce without fertilization, creating seeds that are genetic copies of itself. This has resulted in pockets of cloned trees found nowhere else in the world. And here's a, a close-up of the leaves and fruit. Historically, the edible fruit was sold in Devon's markets as opmast or sorb apples. Existing in mainly small concentrated populations means they're particularly vulnerable to any loss of hedgerows or wooded areas. It's also suffered from accidental removal during land management where people didn't realize it was of interest. Our positive work that we've been doing with Devon White Bean um, was to organise some planting in Peak Hill De Delderfield Community Nature Reserve with others planted across the Sid Vale. And this was funded by the Sustainable Development Fund. Devon White Bean has now become a popular tree for amenity and garden tree planting in Devon. And it's actually led to a shortage of stock this year. So you probably won't find any available, oops. But we hope there will be some more available for planting in the next year or two. Moving on finally to looking at birds and a fairly, fairly brief look at birds. Um, you're probably, most of you are aware there's been a very big decline in farm of birds. So I thought we'd look at that as well as the bats and butterflies. Some of the causes are mainly farming, farming related, as one might imagine. Increased use of pesticide, uh, increased stocking rates, reseeding with um, more commercial and productive grasses rather than the more typically traditional grasses. Switch from hay to silage. All of these things have reduced seed and insect abundance in the countryside. Increased field size has reduced nesting and foraging areas and damaged habitat connectivity. 
when crop rotation changes, such as loss of spring crops, crops and winter stubbles, have impacted on ground nesting birds and winter foraging. Field drainage has removed wetland habitats, which are pretty critical for these species, many of these species. And extreme weather, as we suffer from climate change, may reduce winter survival and breeding success. So if you want more information on farm and birds, obviously there's the RSPB website link there ready for you if you want to read more. And the next pieces of information came from their website, so you can revisit it if you want. There's a, a useful uh, graph which shows the combined trend of decreasing uh, populations uh, for 19 species combined, shows that's what's been happening to their, um, on the graph, their overall numbers. A few of the species on the list have increased, but, the major but more than three quarters of them have, have decreased. And here we have the linnet and tree sparrows. The tree sparrow is distinctive from the house sparrows by having this very brown cap rather than the grayish cap on the top of its head. If you're wondering how to distinguish. And again, what can you do to help farmland and birds? Well, farmland and birds will come into gardens, especially when you live in villages in the countryside. So again, it's a bit, What's a, th a common thread throughout all this is some of the things you can do for bats and butterflies will also help birds. So you'll really be helping three significant groups of species which have all struggled in, in, in the modern agricultural uh, scene. So again, grow plants that support invertebrates and pollinators and provide seed sources. Create a ponds. Retain and plant native trees and hedgerows because the native trees and hedgerows often provide more appropriate food sources for the, for the farm and bird. And again, manage hedgerows with a lighter touch, allowing flowering and fruiting. Where possible, trim sections every other year. Sow native flower seed in your border or lawn. Create a hay meadow effect, again, as another beneficial thing for birds and provide a bird bath and bird seed if you can. I mean, I, I don't, you don't necessarily need one of those fancy stone bird baths and it doesn't have to be raised up. I just use a plastic a gardening tray um, with a, an edge about four inches high, quite cheap from B&Q or any garden center. Um, just fill it with water, put it in a, a, a location where the birds can see if predators or cats are coming. And you'll find that some farmland birds will come along and visit here. I've got starlings, which have declined significantly in the last few years coming and having have great fun in my little plastic tray. Actually, it's not that little, but it's about two feet wide by two feet. But yeah, I, I top it up every day to give them fresh water. And that also benefits a whole range of other species like hedgehogs because they've all got a water source. And in the summer, it can be hard for all these animals to find a, a nearby water source. So keeping that topped up is so valuable to so many different garden species. So just to round off now, really, um, the, the A and B has funding sources to help with nature recovery. And these are sort of more general funding for, for farmland. If you own some farmland in the A and B outside your garden curtilage, you can, you can seek support for wildlife friendly management from our A and B Farming and Protected Landscapes grant scheme. And then there's an email address given there for Pete Youngman, who leads that within the A and B. Um, the minimum grant is £2,000 for that. Or for smaller projects with community involvement, um, you can also apply for funds from our community project fund, and that's that I'm the contact for that one. So you can email me there, and the link obviously will be available on the web after the end of this talk. If you want to come back to it later and, and use the links. And then there's some further sources of information on wildlife friendly gardening. I'm sure many of you will be aware of them, but there's a Wildlife Trust website. I've given you the links so you can come back later and click on the links. The Royal Horticultural Society, RHS, also has useful gardening advice and the RSPB. So you've got three different websites 
And here's a very nice uh, wildlife pond that someone's created. And also some Herbridge, Herbridge lawn there. They've allowed some wildflowers to grow in their lawn. So that's sort of all meshing together really nicely. And we've come to the end of my talk. So thank you for watching and it's been nice talking to you.